think with Little Women, what is so beautiful is that the girls aren't there to serve anyone else's stories other than their own. Bravo! It's so radical and so incredibly modern. This is the type of story that's been passed on to each generation. There's women all over the world who this book has meant a lot to, which is daunting, but really exciting. Greta saw a more modern take on a story about women's choices in life, which seemed to be the right thing to do for today. Little Women is a seminal work in, in the lives of most women of my generation, the generation before me, the generation after. And a lot of it is because there was nothing else like it. There was no other book that focused on young women coming of age. When I was a young executive at Sony, I made the 1994 version. And then it was about 20 years later. And I thought, I think it's time for us to do it again for a new generation. I think we have different things to say. I really wanted to make it about them as adults and how they bring that brave girlhood into adulthood. And so I flung myself at it with everything I had. Louise May Alcott's life was not exactly as she portrayed it in Little Women. She said, I've had a lot of trouble, so I write jolly tales. That is very much what the movie is about. And who will be interested in a story of domestic struggles and joys? Writing them will make them more important. The way that we've portrayed the March family this time is sort of closer to the way Louise May Alcott's family really was who Louisa May Alcott was and who she grew up around is astonishing. She grew up around Ralph Waldo Emerson and all the transcendentalists, and she grew up around Thoreau, and she was part of this movement. And Louisa May Alcott's mother, she was a fascinating woman. Her mother was a radical, a revolutionary, an abolitionist, a feminist. I spent my whole life ashamed of my country. No offense meant, but we should still be ashamed. I know. I am. And I think that it was really important to Greta because if they're rule breakers, as this mother was, and as the girls were in just being independent spirits, we have to figure out the, the various ways we get to do that throughout the storytelling. Laura's way of playing mommy is that she's not just going to be any average mom. There has to be a reason why these girls are the way that they are, and it completely comes from her. <laughs> The March Girls, they're individuals, but they are also different reflections of Louisa. And that was something during rehearsal that we talked a lot about, because I think there's this idea of Louisa May Alcott must be Joe, and it is, but she's also everywhere. Each sister is completely different, and you can't summarize them. That's the whole point. They represent everyone. Oh my gosh, taking on the role of Joe March has been, it has been been a bit of a dream come true because it is so iconic. She is just out and out a writer. That's her whole life. I think apart from her family, that's sort of the only thing that makes sense to her. Everybody holds Joe up as the reason that they became writers. And that was a big task for Sersha. There's a scene in the movie where Joe faces a blank page. And the way we shot it is sort of like, uh, you know, Rocky getting ready for the fight. And she's really astonishing. I think one of the hardest challenges with Jo has been sort of not making her too boyish. If anything, I think she's more similar to girls that you would see in this day and age. I think she's more modern. It almost comes down to something where she doesn't want to play out a gender role at all. And I think that that's one of the things that's so devastating for her when Laurie proposes marriage. There's a case to be made for the fact that their best friendship would lead into a great married life. But then an argument can equally be made about the exact opposite, which is when Joe communicates to Lori in that failed proposal scene. Teddy, I don't believe I will ever marry. I'm happy as I am, and I love my liberty too well to be in any hurry to give it up. She's a tricky one to get right. But I think what really clicked for me was that Jo just sort of has this Peter Pan mentality. You know, she wants to stay young forever and she wants her sisters and Laurie to, to feel the same. And they don't. I kind of always wanted to find with each of the characters like the rub that goes the other direction. And for Jo, the, despite her brashness, that she has this penetrating loneliness in the center of her. Our March is going to Europe! Oh, and she wants me to go with her! Oh, that's wonderful! Oh, now I know why I 
spend all those boring hours reading to her. No, no, she wants me to go. And then there's Amy, who I think she always gets shortchanged. But Amy is incredibly clear-eyed about what the world is. And she's going to figure out how to be a success one way or another. Don't sit there and tell me that marriage isn't an economic proposition, because it is. It may not be for you, but it most certainly is for me. Amy is usually known as the spoiled youngster of the storyline. However, Greta's done it in a, in a better way. She's incredibly passionate about either being the best version of herself as an artist or she won't do it at all. You really get to see her brilliance and her sensitive side. I have been second to Joe my whole life in everything, and I will not be the person you settle for just because you cannot have her. But she's uh, quite a feisty character to play. <laughs> and then there's Meg who wants to be married, and she wants to have children. And in a way, I think she feels embarrassed because Joe also expects everyone to be like her. And I think for Meg, it takes its own courage to say, I don't want that. Just because my dreams are different than yours doesn't mean they're unimportant. If there were a line I would pull out to say why I really wanted to play Meg, it would be that line. It really clearly demonstrates that there is no one way to be a strong woman or to be a feminist. I think Little Women really shows that strength can be found in different places and expressed in different ways. Beth has this quiet power about her. She is sick for a very long time, and during that time, she goes through a journey of self-realization and discovery. I'm not afraid. It's like the tide going out. It goes out slowly, but it can't be stopped. I'll stop it. And that's what's so genius about having these different women. They all go off and have these very, very different lives. <laughs> and yet they come back together again. They're still one. They're still this very sort of strong unit. The sisterly bond is everything. That's the whole book. They love each other. They hate each other. They talk over the top of one another. You burnt it up for me! I burnt your book! It's relevant to, to any age because it's cons consistent and it's, it's real. Action! Is it fairies? Should we do that again? That's lovely. Ooh. Ice cream time! You really can't fake sisterly bonds. Greta really made sure that we got to know each other before the shoot, and she made sure that we had that connection. We had a very luxurious two-week rehearsal period before we started shooting, which is rare and a wonderful thing to have. And Greta loves collaboration. Having been an actor herself, she knows what it's like to be both in front and behind the camera. So it was a a wonderful set. <laughs> Hold on. You've got like one weird hair. <laughs> this is what everybody dreams of when they get married, right? <laughs> I run out in the park. Up. Great. Keep going. <laughs> There's an intelligence and a simplicity to her directing style that I really respect. She's very, very eager to let the scene find itself, no matter what it is she wrote. When I have these great actors, Laura Dern and Meryl Streep and Bob Odenkirk, I could trust them because as soon as they're given the language, they make it even more alive and deeper. Now I can be angry with you in person. And that was the thrill of my life. And with my idols. I was with Meryl last week on a carriage. When does that happen? <laughs> Don't humor me, girl. It's an amazing pinch me moment when you get to work with your legends. Meryl is hysterical as Aunt Marsh. <laughs> I mean, I think everyone knows someone that is so unfiltered to the point of hilarity. Thank you, Aunt Marsh. It was Ooh. Don't like to be kissed. And uh, that's what Aunt Marsh is. Aunt Marsh is someone who really represents the truth about money. She's, I guess, the villain of the piece. And yet, to me, she was someone who had a, a sort of a clear-eyed view of a woman's options. No one makes their own way. Not really. Least of all a woman. And it's not an unrealistic view. It's just she was a little hard-ass about it. You're not entirely wrong. I may not always be right, but I'm never wrong. Good. She doesn't good, approve, good. approve. Yes, thank you. It's really fun to see these different points of view um, within all the characters. You know, these six female, strong, central characters, including Marmee as well as Aunt Marge, and the men are there in support of them finding themselves. I think the main thing that 
Greta wanted to depict with the men of Little Women. They were always an onlooker or an observer of this magical connection that these sisters share and wanting to be a part of it. That sense of finding community and family, even that's not blood, is a big theme in the book. And all of these wonderful men, I try to allow them to be in this kind of imagined egalitarian relationships with these women, which Louise May Alcott wrote in the book, but were not necessarily true of the relationship she saw around her. They were idealized. And I think Lori is one of the first great feminist allies. <laughs> Lori can compliment them, but not in a traditional, boisterous, assertive, masculine way. His grace in their lives has less to do with direct aid or advice and more to do with his presence. And the gratitude they have for him is their friend. What Timothy did with him is just so magical. He is kind of the twin of Joe in a way, um, but gender flipped. And the delight he takes in getting a passport into that world is such a joy to watch. And that's why it's been made this many times and why it's so beloved. And it was one of the first works that men and women alike could point to and go, that, that's a way forward what Louisa wrote all of those years ago to show the confidence that women have in themselves and in their taking their own path. I, I think it's more relevant now than ever. What will you do? I'll open a school for boys and girls both. Of most classic stories, they have to be retold because we're gonna see things differently now. That's an important thing to do. For me, I didn't have to dig to find the modern piece of it. It was just trusting what I heard to be modern. Can you just, just walk straight through? And then just casting a lot of ridiculously talented people. This movie really is a manifestation of her unique uh, vision. It's spirited, it's hopeful, it's like a, a gift to the world right at the time we need it. <laughs> no matter what generation it is, it's a message that children still need to hear. Be your true deep self. Don't let anybody talk you out of your sass, your anger, your sensuality, your vulnerability, your humor. That's who you are. I see the film as a representation of what can be done with female storytelling. And I hope there will be lots more female storytellers and directors and writers and women's stories that start to flood more into the world.